We'll take our reading this evening, first from the Maccabees and then from St. Matthew's Gospel. In facing the strong forces of Nicanor, Maccabees ever trusted with all hope that God would help them. And he exhorted his people not to fear the coming of the nations, but to remember the help they had received before from heaven. And now to hope for victory from the Almighty. And speaking to them out of the law and the prophets, and withal putting them in mind of the battles they had fought before, he made them more cheerful. So he armed every one of them, not with defense of shield and spear, but with very good speeches and exhortations. That's what this mission is about. To arm you with very good, I hope and pray, good speeches and exhortations, most especially remembering the help that we have received from heaven that we will receive it again. From St. Matthew's Gospel we read, And Jesus, calling unto him a little child, set him in the midst of them and said, Amen, I say to you, unless you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So far the Holy Gospel of St. Matthew. And in the creed we hear this, He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. When the prophet Elias challenged the false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel to a liturgical duel as a way to prove whose liturgy was the only true liturgy of God, the real God, The false prophets tried and tried to ignite the fires of their sacrifice using all their diabolical dancing and incantations and cuttings of their own flesh. Even after hours of exhausting efforts, it was of no avail. Then heaven came to the assistance of St. Elias, sending down in an instant consuming fire that utterly devoured his sacrifice to the wonder of all present. Heaven has a liturgy. In performing the proper acts of sacrifice and prayer, Elias was practicing for heaven. He was tapping into the liturgy of heaven, and this pleased heaven. And heaven came to his aid at a crucial moment. A lot was at stake. Later, when the wicked king Okozias sent his men to consult the demon Beelzebub, the same Saint Elias, the great prophet, stopped them from proceeding on such an evil course. This bad king then sent groups of soldiers and bands of 50 each to demand an accounting of Saint Elias and twice Heaven sent down fire to destroy the first two groups, one after the other, incinerated them. They grew more respectful after that and dealt with the man of God properly. Heaven has power. Heaven is known to come to the assistance of those who love and practice for heaven. That is the theme for tonight. Heaven will come to our assistance if we love heaven and we practice for heaven. St. Elias, he practiced so well that he is yet to die. He was carried up into the heavens in a fiery chariot. The prophet Daniel was set up by jealous men under King Darius to abandon his praying toward Jerusalem and read here heaven, the new Jerusalem. They wanted him to stop looking up to heaven. They wanted him to pray like the pagans. They tried to force a new liturgy upon him. No matter, Daniel would look to heaven to pray. King Darius then, forced by the law that he had passed, threw him into the den of starving lions. And angels came from heaven and closed their mouths. After some time, the hungry Daniel was even fed by the prophet Habakkuk who was lifted up by his hair and transported by an angel to Babylon to feed him. After releasing Daniel alive, 
His accusers were then cast into the very same den and eaten by the famished lions before they reached the floor. Hell has no power. Heaven does. When the three young men were cast into the fiery furnace for not participating in false worship, an angel came to protect them from all harm. Meanwhile, a number of those throwing them into the furnace died from the heat. Practice for heaven, and heaven will come to your aid at difficult moments. How we pray has been given to us by heaven. It is important to keep looking up in all our prayers, especially the Holy Mass. Heaven has a liturgy, and the liturgy given by heaven makes connections possible. We put a bookmark there. We'll talk about that later in the mission. In the late 15th century, the king of Naples grew very angry at the wonder worker, St. Francis of Paola, the founder of the Minims. The angry king, just like before with St. Elias, sent troops to arrest him and suppress his monasteries. As the soldiers drew nigh, the saint remained calm, but not his fellow monks. They begged him to hide or flee, and he rebuffed them, saying, My dear brothers, we are in the house of God, and I am sure that he will know how to protect us. If God wills that I should be taken prisoner, let us bow with proper humility to the Almighty's holy will. But if that is not his will, then there's no force on earth that could harm one hair of my head. So saying, Francis went into the church, knelt before the high altar where the Holy Eucharist was kept, and immersed himself deeply in prayer. When the soldiers arrived, they methodically searched all the cells, the church, and even the whole monastery, crossing and recrossing the place. He was before them all the while, kneeling in the church, and they could not see him. As it happened on other similar occasions, the saint became invisible to his enemies. Once the saint appeared, the captain dropped to his knees and converted on the spot. The very one he had come to arrest and carry away in chains, he now honored and begged his forgiveness. Practice for heaven, and heaven will help you. Souls sent to hurt you will become your allies. During the 19th century Spanish revolutions, the Carmelite mystic Blessed Francis Palau was likewise being hunted down multiple times. Taking refuge in a cave once, he gives the following account. They came with orders to shoot me on the spot. The killers were led by a guide, a false companion, a Judas, to the cave where I was staying. They went inside. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, whose feast it was, placed herself in between. She made me invisible to their eyes, and they did not see me or find me. This blessed Carmelite practiced for heaven, and heaven protected him from harm. After six years of imprisonment, amazing story, three of which were solitary confinement. Alessandro Serenelli, the murderer of St. Maria Goretti, showed no signs of repentance or conversion. Yet one night, the little virgin martyr came to him in a dream we all know about, showing him 14 lovely lilies for the 14 wounds he inflicted on her little body with a broad brush hook. When she came to him all dressed in white, glowing with heaven's light. It was he who now wanted to flee from her. She offered him the lilies, saying, Alessandro, take them. He accepted them one by one, and he responded. It was an opening. As he took them, they turned into so many splendid flaming lights. She said, Alessandro, as I have promised, your soul shall someday reach me in heaven. He was filled with contentment. He was ready now to begin the swim up to the home waters of heaven. Wonder of wonders, when he awoke, it seemed that the rabid, choking, hellish, consuming feelings of hate, destruction, and bitterness that ruled him for so many years began to dissolve in the love of the virgin martyr he had killed with his own hands. He changed. 
He started to open up to others. He showed interest in them as well as taking his labors more seriously. He surprised many by his transformation from a sullen loner to a cheerful, cooperative friend. After a time, the local bishop came to visit him. Aldessandro said to him, I want to cast myself upon God's mercy. I want to beg pardon from the family of her whom I destroyed. I want to go on hands and knees before Assunta Goretti and her children for what I have done. And this he did do. And he cried like a baby at the deathbed of Assunta, whom he served well. He then gave himself over with complete submission to confession, attendance at Holy Mass, Holy Communion, and prayer. If you know of anyone who needs assistance, if we love heaven as Maria Gretti did, heaven will come to the assistance of our loved ones to save them from eternal damnation. If only we are willing to die, D-Y-E, all our works in the blood of Christ. Little children like to play what they dream of doing when growing up. They have swords and bows and arrows and guns to be a hunter, a cowboy, or an army soldier. Trucks to build a city and so on. Play altars and play vestments to be a priest. Dolls and tea sets to be a mother and keep house. In our parish... We have none days where many little girls dress up as religious and play the part all day. It is a most edifying sight. Sometimes people ask what religious do, saying, what are they doing in there in that monastery, in that convent with all those walls around it? The answer is very simple. They're playing heaven. Every time we go to Mass, we play heaven. We humble ourselves and ought to become little children before our Heavenly Father. All the saints became children again in the light of heaven's grace. The saints are those who realized in this life that they were indeed very little and needed to play or practice to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Athletes, musicians, doctors and nurses and lawyers and all those who will be judged by others in order to pass some test, the bar exam, whatever it is. These people practice lots so that when the day of their final testing arrives, they may receive the full marks. And so obviously, if we are to make it to heaven, if we are to pass our own judgment at our death with full marks, we need to practice, and we need to practice lots not just on Sundays. This is one of the biggest lessons from the lives of the saints. Practice for heaven now while we have time in this life. In Fatima, May 13, 1917, almost the first words out of Sister Lucia's mouth were, are we going to heaven? Who else is going to heaven? When she saw the heavenly being before her, that's all she could think of. And then as soon as the vision was over, these very same children suddenly became more serious and started training themselves for this divine purpose and getting others to take it seriously about making it to the celestial abode. Before considering all the ways we can and need to play heaven, we must first realize that we are indeed made by God to be heaven dwellers, to be saints. There is a place for us there. If only we will respond to God's grace and do what is needed to make the swim back home. I recently listened to a book on purgatory and some of the people in that place barely made it. It put on display how merciful God is at the last moments of death. But many of these same people openly stated they have to stay in purgatory until the end of time. Why? In a word, they failed to practice. That's it. The good God, the Heavenly Father, has provided us what is necessary to train for beatitude. Thus, the reason for this mission. And by no means am I going to exhaust them. There's so many things to talk about. 
But I want to exhort you to at least get started. Thus their talk tonight. To help each of us take advantage of this, nay, to love and desire our future place in heaven so much that no obstacle whatsoever, whether it be internal or external, will be too much for us to overcome. And God will never allow an obstacle too big for us. Think of those salmon fish. The biggest thing they can overcome is 10 feet. In the same way, no matter what the obstacle is, it's not bigger than 10 feet. Some saint has gotten over this obstacle, and so can you. So let's begin by first countering a modern error. I have to start here. I'm going to try to address errors as we go through. Everybody knows this error. And it's this. Everyone goes to heaven. That's it. You hear it all the time. The real truth, though, is it's not everyone goes to heaven. And there is no universal salvation. That's a condemned heresy. The truth about who goes to heaven helps us reestablish a healthy fear of God in our souls. Something that seems to be lost now. How many times have we heard at a funeral, so-and-so's in heaven, pull out the obituary in the newspaper, and what are you going to read? So-and-so is with the Lord. But our faith tells us something different. That the way to hell is wide and well-traveled. And the way to heaven is narrow and few find it. Many are called, but few are saved. That's what the gospel says over and over again. So when this is understood properly, it is highly motivating. Now, tradition tells us this, that the angels were made on the first day of creation. God said, be light made, and light was made. And God saw the light and that it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness. That's from the very beginning of the Bible. The angels are intelligences. They're pure spirits. And what is more, they were made in the state of grace. Thus, they are light of the first day on the highest level, the lowest level of light. It's maybe energy that God made. God always works on different levels. And surely, as the fathers teach us, the meaning of light is not just one thing. In any case, those unwilling to love and serve God were separated from the light and became darkness. The book of the Apocalypse tells us one third of the angels fell at that time. It fixed them forever. One third went to hell and two thirds went to heaven. Thus we read in the apocalypse, the dragon's tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Chapter 12. Now, how many angels are there, we might ask? Seemingly innumerable. We return again to our Carmelite mystic, Blessed Francis Palau. He says, God has created intellects which are purely spiritual much more sublime than man. These are the angels whose number exceed, listen to his words, whose number exceeds the grains of the sand in the seashores to the stars of heaven and the leaves of the trees and of grasses, get a load of this, that have existed, exist now, and will exist on the earth. That's innumerable. That's unfathomable. But if it's accurate... It's incomprehensible, but it gives us a good idea of how many angels there are beyond reckoning. This is important, though. A long-standing tradition tells us that humans will take the place of the fallen angels. This has some foundation in the gospel where his majesty tells us about the parable of the banquet in which those invited did not come. And so the empty places had to be filled and off went the servants to find replacements. Even the dregs were found. Bring them in. We will fill these places. We're not going to start until they're filled. And that's from the gospel. The proud angels did not come. So God found and converted sinful man to take his place. Their places are still being filled. And make no mistake, grace is never lost. They lost the grace, but we get it. The grace that was going to be designated and for the glorified angels that fell is given to man. 
Now, given that the angels, and this is where it gets a little scary, given that the angels were in a state of grace to begin with, it is understood, as scary as this may sound, that about a third of those over all time who are in a state of grace or were in a state of grace will be saved. So you look at all mankind from beginning to end, everybody in a state of grace, one third of those are the ones that take the place of the fallen angels in heaven. And the rest are lost. For a scriptural foundation for this, we look to prophet Zacharias, chapter 13. Listen to his words. They fit very well. He says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that cleaveth to me, saith the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. In other words, there's going to be a test. We're going to be tested. And it says, and I will turn my hand to the little ones, to the children willing to practice. He says, and there shall be in all the earth, saith the Lord, two parts and it shall be scattered. Two parts in all the earth and shall perish. But the third part shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them. I will refine them as silver is refined. And I will try them as gold is tried. In other words, the salmon fish is going to swim against all odds to the home waters. Scarred as it may be when it arrives. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. Heaven will help them. I will say thou art my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. There it is. Zacharias chapter 13. A third are saved that call upon the Lord and cleaveth to him to take the place of the third that fell into hell. These are the ones who are willing to practice and endure the trials that come. It is this. Is this so hard to believe when we consider that only two men, Joshua and Caleb, passed through the desert to enter the promised land when Israel came out of Egypt in the great exodus? But with most of them, God was not well pleased, the Bible says, for they were overthrown in the desert. In any case, logically, according to this tradition, when the vacancies of the fallen angels are filled, time comes to an end. But do we know the number? David tried to number the people in the promised land and he sinned in doing so. Moses was directed to number the people on the way to the promised land. And it's interesting to look at it. Many lines of men failed and disappeared. They were extinguished because of their sin. The important thing is to strive to be among the number of the saints. And, to, and once again, this takes effort. This takes practice. Now, using the via negativa, sometimes it helps to look at the opposite. And we can practice for heaven. Sad to say, the majority of man is practicing for hell. And that's a fact. Once again, our Lord said the way to hell is wide and well-traveled. I'm not saying anything on my own. Let's use the via negativa. We have seen the children of Fatima change dramatically by seeing the opposite of heaven, namely hell. Sister Lucia writes of Jacinta, the vision of hell filled her with such horror to such a degree that every penance of mortification was nothing in her eyes if it could only prevent souls from going there. Jacinta often sat thoughtfully on the ground or on a rock and exclaimed, Oh, hell, hell, how sorry I am for the souls who go to hell. And the people down there burning alive like wood in the fire. Jacinta remained on her knees for long periods of time, saying the same prayer over and over again. And from time to time, like someone waking from sleep, she called out to her brother or me, Francesco, Francesco, are you praying with me? We must pray very much to save souls from hell. So many go there. So many. I am so sorry for sinners. If only I could show them hell. Seems to me that one way to understand the dangers involved with everybody goes to heaven is to take a case of a fortiori. That's a, a strongest case. And see if this person can fall, who do we think we are? 
person I have in mind is Solomon. It seems agreed upon by the saints, as hard as this is to hear, the majority of men go to the abode down below, as we've stated. The sewer system of the universe. That's what hell is. The sewer system of the universe. And when the devil is exercised, he always likes to talk about the sewer. He's really good at it. Because that's his home. He's in the sewer system of the universe. We don't want to go down there. Now, according to the number of saints and doctors, even the great Solomon fell into hell and is lost. From scriptures we read, when it praises all the other patriarchs, when it gets to Solomon, it doesn't end well with him. It says, but you laid your loins beside women and through your body, you were brought into subjection. You put a stain upon your honor and defiled your posterity so that you brought wrath upon your children and they were grieved at your folly so that the sovereignty was divided and a disobedient kingdom arose out of Ephraim. St. Augustine says in three different places, here's what he says of Solomon. The scriptures tell us with faithful accuracy, both the good that Solomon had at first and the evil actions by which he lost the good he began with. In another place, and about him, scripture is not silent, but accuses him of being a lover of strange women. For in the beginning of his reign, he was inflamed with a desire for wisdom. But after he had attained it through spiritual love, he lost it through carnal lust. Again, in another place, St. Augustine, Solomon himself was a lover of women and was rejected by God. And this lust was so great a snare unto him that he was induced by women even to sacrifice to idols. As scripture witnesses concerning him, what marvel that Solomon fell among God's people, he questions. Did not Adam fall in paradise? Did not an angel fall from heaven and become the devil? We are thereby taught that no hope must be placed in any among men. And what danger a man is in today with all the billboards and all the availability of electronic media for men to fall with women. The great wise Solomon fell. Do we think we're so smart and so strong? St. Clement of Rome, he's a pope. He adds this. Hast thou not read the history of Solomon, the son of David, the man to whom God gave wisdom and knowledge and largeness of mind and riches and much glory beyond all men? Yet this same man through women came to ruin and departed from the Lord. The scriptures say God came to him twice to warn him to no avail. If someone so great as Solomon could fail so miserably, are we so certain about ourselves and those whom we love? Let us not fall into the false compassion and outright error that everyone goes to heaven at least sooner or later. Want to avoid that popular destination of man, which has always been known to be hell. That is until our times. Now the popular destination is heaven. It's their imaginary heaven. It's not the heaven that God dwells in. We need to practice for heaven and we need to play heaven. Von Cochin in The Last Four Things writes, For the timid, slothful, spiritless person, they delude themselves with the false hope that after all, heaven is not hard to win. They think and say to themselves, it's not so bad a case as some would make it. Christ did not suffer for us for naught. If it were not God's will that we should be saved, he would not have created us for the enjoyment of heaven. These and similar words we hear from the lips of the children of this world, says von Kochum. They live according to these notions and succeed in deceiving themselves and others. Now, so far, we have seen how heaven comes to the aid of those who become little and practice or play heaven like little children. We have examined the via negativa, the opposite way, the popular destination of man, at least a little. We'll come back to it. We've looked into hell and considered the fewness of the saved. This ought to motivate us to renew our efforts to practice anew, to reach the celestial abode. 
For additional motivation, now let's consider how heaven is also known to scatter evil, to break down evil and in our midst when we practice. When we look at the end of time, we know that his majesty will come in a cloud of saints. A great power and great majesty will be his. He will slay the Antichrist with his coming. Evil will cower and flee and seek to hide under the mountains. All evil will be judged and cast into the lake of fire and locked up for all eternity. No wonder St. Paul repeats often in his letters the need to love his coming. He repeats it over and over with effects, with effects like these happening on that day. We can see why it is good to love his coming as the apostles mentioned. Now, this is important because something of this scattering of evil can be ours. And we can have it now for those who train for heaven, who love heaven, and love is coming. I'm going to give a couple of examples. We've already heard how St. Elias was victorious over the false prophets of Israel. They all died on that day, and evil was put into confusion. In the Acts of the Apostles, we read how time and time again the Apostle St. Paul shut down false oracles by his presence. This was bad for business. So the mob rose up to stone him and run him out of town. And I think one time they even killed him. It doesn't say it, but it kind of says it in the Acts. He gets right back up again and walks right away. You can't get up and walk after being stoned. Something happened. It was miraculous. St. Saturninus comes to mind as well. We his feast days on November 29th. He was the bishop of Toulouse in the year 245. As it turns out, he often passed near the chief temple of idolatry in that city, in France, in Gaul. He was on his way to the Catholic Church, the cathedral. In this temple of idolatry was an oracle that he passed by. And every time he passed by, the devils were struck dumb and speechless. That's bad for business. The wicked priests figured out, the satanic priest, that who was causing this? And they proceeded to martyr the bishop. It seems he reached the headwaters and he dyed his efforts with his blood and that of Christ. And he helped to make France the eldest daughter of the church. But see how St. Saturninus just coming around scattered evil. He silenced lying devils. It's a foreshadowing of the second coming. Heaven scatters evil in many ways for those who practice for heaven. One of the greatest trials people face in their life is the inability to forgive those who have injured them, whether really injured them or at least perceived. We deal with it. We suffer for it. And they end up living with this forever, these resentments, it seems. They carry them around all their life. We live in a time of much abuse and deep wounds and fractured marriages and families. For many, these become very difficult obstacles for the swim home. But the saints were able to conquer even this evil with the aid of heaven. They scattered them. The 16th century Thomas More was a man of great dignity and charm, and he comes to mind. A man worth much to the realm of England. Yet he was falsely accused, falsely charged, and held in prison unjustly, robbed of his name and his estate. And he was finally martyred. He had every reason to hate those around him. It is the common story of the faithful. As more approached death, he started to view all things in heaven's light, though. He started thinking about things from the perspective of heaven. That's one of the main themes tonight. If we just put ourselves in heaven and look back, we can overcome all these difficulties. What should we do to get here? As more approached death, he started to view all things in heaven's light. He learned that in heaven, they live in complete unity. Even the deadliest of enemies are reconciled there as friends. And they're intimate friends. St. Maria Goretti and Alessandro Serenelli. St. Thomas wrote in prison as he physically deteriorated and approached death these profound words. Bear no malice or evil will to any man living. For either the man is good or he is wicked. If he is good and I hate him, then I am wicked. If he is wicked, either he will amend and die good and go to God, 
or live wickedly and die wickedly and go to the devil. And then let me remember that if he be saved, he will not fail, if I am saved too, as I trust to be, to love me very heartily. And I shall then in like manner love him. And why should I now then hate one for this while and this life who shall hereafter love me forevermore? And why should I now be then an enemy to him with whom I shall in time be coupled in eternal friendship? And on the other side, if he will continue to be wicked and be damned, then is there in hell such outrageous eternal sorrow before him that I may well think myself a deadly cruel wretch if I would not rather pity his pain than malign his person. Besides, if we don't forgive him, we may join him. If one say that we may with good conscience wish an evil man harm, lest he should do harm to other folk who are innocent and good, I will not now dispute upon that point, for that root has many branches to be well weighed and considered that I, that I can now conveniently write, having no other pen than a piece of coal. But truly will I give counsel to every good friend of mine, and that unless he be put in such a position as to punish an evil man in his charge by reason of his office, he should leave the desire of punishing to God and to such other folk who are so grounded in charity and so fast cleaved to God that no secretly malicious or cruel affection can creep in and undermine them under the cloak of just and virtuous zeal. But let us that are no better than men of mean sort ever pray for such merciful amendment to other folk as our own conscience shows us that we have need of in ourselves. There it is. Here's the prayer he wrote before he died. I think it might have been the last thing he wrote. Almighty God, have mercy on, fill in the blank, King Henry, Cromwell, and on all that bear me evil will and would harm me, and by such easy, tender, and merciful means as thine infinite wisdom can best devise, grant that their faults and mine may be both amended and redressed. And make us save souls in heaven together. There it is. Make us save souls together in heaven. Where we may ever live and love together with thee and thy blessed saints. O glorious Trinity, grant this for the sake of the bitter passion of our sweet Savior Christ. Amen. Don't you see how evil is scattered from the saints when they look up to heaven? His way up to the home waters of heaven then opened wide. And now he's a saint. Lack of forgiveness is an obstacle to heaven because there is no lack of forgiveness in heaven. You get it? Again, lack of forgiveness is an obstacle to heaven because there is no lack of forgiveness in heaven. It can and must be overcome. What is the secret of Thomas More's forgiveness? The same as it was for St. Maria Goretti. To look at our neighbor from the point of view, from the perspective of heaven, and then all will be clarified. And we will be ready to approach the altar of God with true love. St. Therese acted so in her convent. She looked upon all her sisters as if they were already together in heaven. And she set about loving the one she found the most difficult. And some were very difficult. Can we not see in this how powerful it is to practice for heaven? The great Catholic president of Ecuador, the 19th century president, Gabriel Garcia Moreno, was ruthlessly attacked by Freemasons near the Capitol building of Quito. As he lay dying from gunshots and sword thrusts, he said, God does not die. He had just attended Mass at the altar of St. Mary Magdalene in the Dominican monastery and made a visit to the Blessed Sacrament in the cathedral as he made his way to work as the president of Ecuador. He was taken into the nearby cathedral and laid before the altar of Our Lady of Sorrows after he was attacked. There, amazingly, still alive, he confessed, received the last rites, and openly forgave his cruel enemies. He practiced for heaven, and heaven came to his aid. 
Now, perhaps you're saying, this is hard, Father. I keep failing. I'm not sure I can make the swim home. That obstacle seems taller than 10 feet to me. In the gospel, his majesty tells a parable where the, where God sent many servants to those governing his vineyard. Each of them was rejected. If you remember the story, they were beaten and some were killed. Then he sent his only son. One of the messages of this parable is simply this. God renews his efforts. He keeps trying. He gives us new opportunities to reform and change our lives before the judgment comes. Is this not a fitting theme for a mission? We're given yet another chance to start anew. That's what this mission is about. To receive the graces of God, to reform and renew our lives. To get to work while we have time. Or, as St. Thomas More puts it, to buy the time again that we have lost. The sun is still shining, dearly beloved. Night is not yet here. Let's work. Let's do good and practice virtue. If we do so, God will grant grace to bring to completion the good works he has given us to do. Prayer and penance and almsgiving, acts of mortification and reparation, all to build up the city of God. Yet it is also true that we're human with fallen nature. We give up rather easily at times when we see little or no progress. When we see those set over us and all around us so very lax nay, even corrupt, seemingly to the core. We settle into a sort of state of coexistence with the problems about us and in us. Very dangerous. This is a dangerous place to be, as our faults, if not given judicious resistance, can become like weeds, hard to manage and overgrown, outstripping the good wheat that God has sown. How many just give up saying, this is who I am, Love me or leave me. You made me like this. You just have to accept me like this. Looking into the lives of the saints and even successful seculars on the natural plane, we find something altogether different, don't we? I know a man who said he had to fail at business at least a couple of times. I think he said three. Even he had to sneak out of town in the middle of the night due to angry debtors in order not to get arrested or killed, before he finally was very successful and paid back all his debtors. He kept trying, in other words. George Washington, according to my studies, was not the best of generals. His battle plans were often too complicated and such that no one could carry them out effectively in the heat of battle. But at the end of the day's battle, he was always there, still standing, even when multiple horses were shot out from under him. Arguably, he was a success because he was the one still standing at the end of the day. He kept going. He kept trying. He kept renewing his efforts. A simple example in my own life, I myself tried and tried and tried to give up drinking soda, but it was so addicting It took me three years of Advents and Lents to break the habit. That was over 20 years ago. I've not had any sense except a sip to practically spit it out. It tastes so terrible. Once you do that, you'll know what I'm talking about. Would that we had such tenacity in the spiritual life. That is, our life in seeking total union of hearts with God and total perfection of our human nature. Something that is required to reach the heavenly home. Imitation of Christ mentions the beautiful book that if only we would eradicate one fault a year, oh, how perfect we should be. Oh, that would be practicing for heaven. To eradicate a fault every year. His majesty said, he who perseveres to the end is saved. He who perseveres in his efforts to seek holiness, conformity to God's will, and is still standing at the end of the battle, he is saved. St. Paul, quoting the Psalms of David, said, Each day I die. This great apostle was multiple times, as we've heard, imprisoned, beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, nearly to death, it seems, only to rise up again each time to gain the victory. Each day I die. 
No despairing allowed in God's mystical city. Not even little D despairing. All must be conquered, and it will be. Let's keep trying. Remember Christ coming in the clouds of the saints. Don't you want to be a part of that cloud? St. Anthony, the great desert father, instructed those around him, each day act as though you just begun to enter religious life and started practicing his exercises so that your good intention may grow ever stronger. Above all, think each day that you may die. In another place, he says, each day act as though it were the last day of your life. Each day ought to be like a little image of our life. This is an important message we need to drill into ourselves. When we get up in the morning, we make the sign of the cross. We ought to. First thing, conscious thought out of the mind is the sign of the cross. Invoke the holy name of Jesus or something like for the greater honor and glory of God and the salvation of souls. And then use your holy water and then nail down and say your prayers. This is a recalling of our beginnings in the headwaters of baptism. Then we go out and fight against the powers of darkness and our own fallen nature until the day ends. We kneel down and make an examination of conscience and a good act of contrition for the faults of the day, crawling into bed as if into our coffin. Thus did St. Thomas More have among his resolutions to have the last thing in remembrance, to have ever before my eyes my death as ever at hand, to make death no stranger to me. St. Philip Neri said, the best way to prepare for death is to spend every day of your life as though it were your last. Oh, what good we would then do. Think about it, though. Each day is your life, and your life is your day. As you begin your life in, with Christ in baptism, so you begin your day. As you hope to end your life with Christ at the end, so you should end your day. Let your day represent your whole life. We must begin anew every day and keep trying. So many give up. Jacob, the patriarch, had to keep starting over under the crafty Laban to gain his freedom and return home with his family, the very family that became the 12 tribes of Israel. Moses is a very important example here of perseverance. He tried to help the Israelites overcome their Egyptian overlords. He killed the brutal Egyptian. It did not work. He had to flee. Yet God called him up the mountain to begin anew before the burning bush. He resisted. He resisted this renewed effort to start over, but God made him begin anew. Moses conformed his will to God's with great success. Yet again and again, time and time again, the good man had to start over. He broke the tablets and had to make new ones. He led the people inside of the promised land and had to turn back. He interceded for the people time and time again as if they were worth every effort. Only once he failed. And this kept him from the promised land until he appeared before his majesty on Mount Tabor. Amazing starts and restarts, are they not? Read the life of Moses. What courage he must have had not to give up. This is the courage we need to. Let us do good while there's still time. Many saints had to start and restart over and over in their practicing. Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda was told to burn her magnificent work, the mystical city of God, two times by a misguided confessor, only to be scolded by her normal superior and confessor to start it all over again. Thank God she did. St. Louis de Montfort had to start over and over again due to the resistance of the Jansenists in the various dioceses he gave missions. St. John Vianney, the curie of ours, would spend long hours in his young priesthood developing a sermon and practicing it only to get stuck in the pulpit and had to leave without finishing it. He would just stop and give up and try again next time. How disheartening it must have been. But he's a saint and he's incorrupt. 80,000 people came to him a year by the time he died. He took a whole trainload of people to heaven. He saw into heaven. 
At the age of 16, St. Benedict Joseph Labre resolved to embrace a religious life and spent the next several years going in and out of the most strict orders he could find in the church, the Trappists, the Carthusians, and the Cistercians. He remained cheerful, resolved, and hopeful throughout his trial, even with his family and relatives pressuring him to give up and accusing him of trying to escape the responsibilities of living in the world. When he was allowed to enter the Cistercians for a third try, although they admired his exactness in religious observance and his humility endeared him to the whole community, his health gave way. It was decided that his vocation lay elsewhere, and he became God's perpetual pilgrim, living in Rome and going to Our Lady of Loreto and other places. He's a saint now. He didn't give up. They made it. Their practice worked. In dealing with difficult neighbors and family members, St. John of the Cross said this, Treat everyone as a stranger. Treat them as if you met them anew. Forget all they have done or are doing. God seems to do that for us. Is that not yet another meaning of the parable of the vineyard? He kept trying anew as if he were just meeting them the first time. And this is what we too must do if we are to practice for heaven. There's no giving up. It is an all or nothing affair. Let us summarize what we've learned tonight. But I want to exhort you to practice for heaven. To make it to heaven, we must practice. And we have to practice daily, not just on Sundays. Second of all, the saints show us that this practice starts with prayer. Are we praying as the saints did? That is, by using what the church has provided us. Are we attending Mass regularly and being exposed to the heavenly rays it provides when we're able? Number three, not everyone goes to heaven. Thus, we must work out our salvation in fear and trembling, as St. Paul tells us. Again, this requires we practice and practice our whole life. You can never be sure. Remember Solomon. Use every day as if it were a representation of your whole life, beginning and ending each day with prayer, always willing to start anew and strive to do all that God has willed for us. If you fail today, there's always tomorrow. Let's keep trying. Let's be ready. Number four, overcoming obstacles to heaven is possible and required. Even the obstacle of unforgiveness and deep wounds, whatever their cause, and the saints have proven that it can be done. Never say it can't be done in your case. It can. Number five, heaven comes to the aid of those who love heaven and practice to be heaven dwellers. Heaven scatters evil, and this scattering will be definitive on the last day. Let us be numbered among those in the cloud of saints that come with his majesty on that day of days. By working now with him, now to scatter evil in our times. Number six, to do this well, let us set about reading regularly a life of the saint and live each day as if it were our last. And we add on to this, to do this well without fail, St. Philip Neri teaches us this, to begin and end well. Devotion to our Blessed Lady, the Mother of God, is nothing less than indispensable. May the rosary be always part of our daily lives and efforts to buy the time that we have lost. I once saw a holy card of His Majesty standing in the gate of heaven, bathed in heaven's light, welcoming the faithful soul home. I'll never forget it. And it said, I never said it would be easy but worth it. Another priest liked to tell those feeling the struggle, feeling the swift current of the stream they're swimming against, cheer up. It'll all be over soon.